Welcome to the UCLA Esophageal Insight Zoom series. We're very happy you were able to make it today. I'll be talking about transnasal esophagoscopy in dysphagia evaluation and management. My name is Dinesh Chetri. I'm a professor and vice chair of the Department of Head and Neck Surgery and a laryngologist specializing in voice, airway, and swallowing disorders at UCLA. So when we talk about the goals of dysphagia evaluation and management, it is first to evaluate the swallowing deficits and the possible etiologies. You want to assess the swallowing de deficit from the lips to the stomach. And then ultimately, you're going to recommend a safe diet for the patient. So what are the techniques we have available to assess dysphagia? So first, in the office, we can do a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, also known as FEES. We also order fluoroscopic studies, a modified barium swallow study, also known as video fluoroscopic swallow study. There have been some techniques developed for sensory testing of the larynx, although we have not been really using it very much. There is the barium sophogram that you are probably quite well aware of, and also more recently, high resolution esophageal manometry that we discuss a lot in our center. Today I'm going to talk about transnasal esophagoscopy, which has uh, really improved our ability to assess the swallowing deficit from the lips to the stomach. So otolaryngology and laryngology in particular is headed towards more in-office procedures. And the reason for this is the availability of the transnasal endoscope with the working channel. So prior to having a working channel available in our office, we could take a look at the nasopharynx, we could do a laryngoscopy, we could do a stroboscopy for voice disorders, but we were quite limited. When you have a flexible scope in the office with a working channel, you can do a lot more things. So first, you can give topical anesthesia close-up. So you can do a close-up laryngoscopy. You can do a bronchoscopy. You are now able to put instruments through the working channel. So you can do biopsies. You can do excisions. You can do injections. With the air pressure, obviously, what we're going to talk about today, we can do a esophagoscopy. And in patients with total laryngectomy, we can do tracheoesophageal punctures and voice prosthesis placement right in the office. We are also able to do esophageal dilation because we can put catheters through the working channel and also laser endoscopy because of the ability to put laser fibers through the working channel. One thing to remember is that currently the uh, transnasal endoscopes are typically 5.1 millimeter or less with a working channel that's two millimeters in diameter. So you cannot pass uh, instruments or balloons that require a channel uh, of 2.8 millimeters. So transnasal esophagoscopy is a relatively new diagnostic technology. The features that made this possible are, number one, the small diameter chip tip flexible esophagoscopes. The second is that because of the small size, we can now do these procedures through the transnasal route and no sedation is needed. And this does allow us to perform comprehensive in-office upper aerodigestive tract evaluation without the use of sedation with a diagnostic accuracy that's quite similar to sedated esophagoscopy. So I will cover these topics today, uh, t and &E equipment, uh, esophageal anatomy and physiology at, as it is related to t and &E, t and &E indications, technique, and common findings. So first, TN equipment. It's quite straightforward. You need a endoscope, seen here, and then you need a video processor and air pump. You do need suction tubing. You do need a suction apparatus that's in the room. And then you just need some topical anesthetics, typically uh, lidocaine, 4% lidocaine on pledgets. It is somewhat expensive to start this, uh, but you know most of these instruments are quite expensive. So minimum outlay for this currently is probably about $67,000 as written over here on the left. So let's talk about uh, anatomy of the esophagus. It's a muscular tube that's 18 to 22 centimeters long. 
The distance from the nose to the upper esophageal sphincter is about 20 centimeters, and from the nose to the lower esophageal sphincter is about 45 centimeters. The upper esophagus is, uh, uh, consists of a striated muscle, and the lower two-thirds of the esophagus is smooth muscle, and there is a transition zone in between. The muscle wall contains mucosa, so mucosa, and muscularis propria, but has no serosal covering. So when you're doing a transnasal esophagoscopy, you do encounter these four natural constrictions. The first one is the cricopharyngeal constriction at the top of the esophagus, followed by the constriction at the level of the aorta, followed by constriction at the level of the left mainstem bronchus, and then finally at the level of the lower esophageal sphincter and the diaphragm. So knowing these constrictions helps you quite a bit as you are performing the procedure. And here are some examples of what a transnasal esophagoscopy might look like, the views at the cricopharyngeal uh, constriction around the level of the aorta. Here is the left mainstem bronchus and the lower esophageal sphincter. One thing to remember is, unlike sedated esophagoscopy, you are facing the patient. So when you're looking at the monitor, this, the anterior is towards the bottom of the picture and the posterior part of the patient is towards the top of the picture. I want to touch briefly on the anatomy of the upper esophageal sphincter because this is the first uh, challenge doing a transnasal esophagoscopy. So the UES has two definitions, an anatomic definition uh, defined as the cricopharyngeus muscle. It's approximately one centimeter in height. And there is also a manometric definition defined as a zone of interluminal high pressure that exists between the pharynx and the upper esophagus typically two to four centimeter long. And part of the inferior constrictor is also involved in this high pressure zone. And so typically it can also be called a inferior pharyngeal constrictor. And this is a view of the, uh, of the upper esophageal sphincter uh, in a barium sophogram showing the area of the UES, but then primarily uh, the most obvious structure here is the cricopharyngeus. And I suspect uh, having, uh, you know, performed uh, myotomies, uh, I do think that the cricopharyngeus is the primary uh, contributor to the upper esophageal sphincter. So the opening of the upper esophageal sphincter ends the pharyngeal phase and allows bolus passage into the esophagus and starts the esophageal phase of swallowing. And three events are necessary for UES opening. The first is hyoid displacement anteriorly and superiorly, both about 10 to 12 millimeters. So you need intact strap muscles to perform the hyolaryngeal elevation. The second is what we call intrabolus pressure. In other words, you want the pharyngeal muscles to be able to contract. You want the pharyngeal pump intact so that the bolus has pressure to go towards the esophagus. And finally, you need intact vagal innervation because the upper esophageal sphincter does need to relax uh, during the swallow to allow the bolus to go into the esophagus. I really love this picture, kind of showing, how, showing uh, hyolaryngeal elevation. Uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, these uh, open circles showing the uh, hyoid bone elevating superiorly and anteriorly, and the closed circles showing where the UES is actually open. And you can again see that the opening is actually only occurring at the top of the hyolaryngeal elevation, or at the height of the hyoid elevation. So it's important to remember this when we're thinking about upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. Once the bolus enters the esophagus, uh, it uh, primarily uh, uh, travels anterograde through primary peristalsis, which starts at the upper esophageal sphincter and goes to the lower esophageal sphincter. And typically, the time is between uh, anywhere from eight seconds to 14 seconds. There is also secondary peristalsis, which is a response to distension and can start in the mid esophagus. And it's really important when, uh, you know, one has ineffective primary peristalsis or uh, the gastric reflux, reflux needs to be cleared by the esophagus. The reason this is important is because, as I will discuss later, we can actually look for esophageal dysmotility by uh, challenging the esophagus with food during a transnasal esophagoscopy as well.
So water or saline instilled into the esophagus during transnasal esophagoscopy should be cleared by the esophagus quite quickly. And finally, the lower esophageal sphincter, the mucosa uh, at that point, uh, a stratified squamous epithelium uh, until it gets to the uh, gastroesophageal junction, uh, meeting the gastric columnar epithelium. So in summary, the esophagus is a muscular tube, 18 to 22 centimeters long, with four natural constrictions or indentations at the cricopharyngeal, cricopharyngeous muscle, aortic knob, left mainstem bronchus, and the lower esophageal sphincter. There is, this is an involuntary swallowing apparatus with a esophageal swallowing phase lasting about 8 to 13 seconds, as opposed to the pharyngeal phase, only, which only lasts about a second. And then there are two types of peristalsis, primary and secondary. I also want to cover uh, uh, the sensory pathways of the, the uh, esophagus briefly. The sensation from the esophagus travels along the uh, spinal and vagal pathways. Uh, pain is conveyed through the third through eighth thoracic sympathetic nerves, and heart and pericardium are supplied by the first through fifth thoracic sympathetic nerves. So, the reason this is important for us in otolaryngology is because pain from both of these sites, both the heart and the esophagus, can radiate to the arm, back, and also the jaws. And then there are these issues about whether or not, you know, certain reflex pathways exist. There is a esophagopharyngeal reflex, a esophagoesophageal reflex, as we know, because acid exposure to the esophagus increases upper esophageal sphincter pressure. There is esophagotracheobronchial reflex, where acid exposure in the trachea or esophagus increases re respiratory resistance. And these reflex pathways are thought to play a role in laryngopharyngeal and pulmonary diseases. Uh, but we know that suppression on acid does not always improve symptoms. The reason I'm discussing this is because, you know, when we have these extraesophageal symptoms, uh, we often ask whether or not a esophageal uh, screening is necessary and what the utility is of the TNE in that situation. So let me briefly go through indications. So why, why do we want to do a transnasal esophagoscopy? First is that we want to see what's going on where you can't see it with laryngoscopy alone. Uh, up to 20% of patients with extraesophageal symptoms have esophageal abnormalities, such as Barrett's or dysmotility. And laryngopharyngeal symptoms are more predictive of esophageal adenocarcinoma than esophageal symptoms. So transnasal esophagoscopy is invaluable in the assessment of patients with dysphagia. When the oropharyngeal swallow is normal and esophageal pathology is suspected, like eosinophilic esophagitis or achalasia, esophageal webs and strictures. When there is an abnormal esophagram, such as a esophageal stricture or a web, or in the evaluation of follow and follow-up of a gastroesophageal reflux disease, looking for any changes uh, in uh, Barrett's changes in the esophagus. So these can all be done quite easily in the office, you know, very quickly in 10 minutes or so. It is also useful in patients who have globus sensation where the laryngeal exam does not account for the symptoms. So we can evaluate for esophagitis, upper esophageal sphincter abnormalities, and neoplasms. In other area digestive tract pathology, such as head and neck cancer, we often need to perform a pan endoscopy to evaluate for second primary cancers or recurrence of uh, esophageal tumor. And in situations where patients have Zenker's diverticulum or other esophageal diverticula, TNE can be used to confirm the diagnosis, or when TNE is used as a primary methodology, it can also identify these uh, diverticula of the upper esophagus. So, Basically, the idea is that we can now do a procedure that previously required a trip to the operating room. So it's largely replaced pan endoscopy, uh, largely replaced esophagrams in my practice. Uh, it has decreased risks through the patients as well. You know, hypoxia caused by conscious sedation accounts for about 50 to 60 percent of morbidity and mortality from sedated endoscopy. And so this technique will eliminate the risk uh, of sedation. There is less downtime for the surgeon and less downtime for the patient as well with overall cost savings.
So this kind of rehashes what I just talked about, a difference between sedated uh, endoscopy and office-based transnasal esophagoscopy, talking about, you know, shortening the procedure time with TNE, no sedatives, no post-procedure monitoring, and the patient can get back to normal activities right away. And with a diagnostic capabilities that's very similar to standard endoscopy. This is an example showing hypopharyngeal and esophageal perforation after EGD that uh, we had to treat recently. And so this is something we can avoid with TNE. So obviously the main indication for TNE is patients with dysphagia. Patients with esophageal dysphagia will often simply say, I have trouble swallowing. And we also know that dysphagia of esophageal origin is often referred to the neck. So if you ask the patient where the food gets stuck, they might point to the sternal notch or the chest area as the area that food hangs up. But more often than not, patients can't be specific as to the location. So in my practice, you know, I will do a endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. In other words, I'm feeding the patient food in the office, looking at the swallowing with my endoscope at the, of the pharyngeal phase. And if their, if their oropharyngeal swallowing is normal, and patients have a very strong dysphagia history, then this is a perfect patient who needs a uh, transnasal esophagoscopy. Heartburn is another good indication for uh, a TNE. So as we know, burning uh, heartburn is a burning uh, feeling rising from the stomach or lower chest, going up towards the neck. There is high specificity for positive pH test and heartburn symptoms, but the sensitivity is low. In other words, acid reflux does not always lead to heartburn. Heartburn is often associated with bitter taste in the mouth. So in terms in terms of TNE, we can treat heartburn empirically, but sometimes it's, it's nice to be able to visualize the anatomy before we put patients on long-term treatment. Another consideration is patients who have extraesophageal symptoms, you know, chest pain, uh, oropharyngeal dysphagia, or with no obvious objective oropharyngeal dysphagia, globus sensation, chronic cough, hoarseness, asthma, you know, we, we could probably spend a lot of time talking about whether or not the esophagus is really involved in all of these disorders, but we might, might consider looking at the esophagus in these situations. For example, in globus, which is a, a lump or fullness uh, or a tickle in the throat, it has been associated with uh, cricopharyngeal echolasia, abnormal visceral sensation, gastroesophageal reflux disease, esophageal dysmotility, and even esophageal webs and diverticula. So one could make the argument that all patients with globus and normal oropharyngeal findings need a esophageal screen. What about chronic cough, chronic throat clearing? The etiologies for chronic cough include gastroesophageal reflux disease, cough variant asthma, chronic rhinosinusitis, and then when we find those areas clear of any uh, objective abnormalities, we often, uh, you know, say that the chronic cough is due to sensory neuropathy uh, uh, of, the, of the larynx or the vagal nerve. So uh, it's, it's quite uh, controversial whether GERD can cause cough. Uh, some of the ideas are that there is a esophagotracheal bronchial cough reflex. There are some uh, indications that this could be related to microaspiration although it is quite difficult to prove that. So having said that, my typical treatment approach for chronic cough is to assess all causes of chronic cough, looking at the sinuses, pulmonary system, and the esophagus. And if GERD is suspected, an empiric PPI treatment of one to two months is very reasonable. But if not improved, then uh, a, a esophagoscopy and pH testing is indicated. So next, I want to talk a little bit about the technique itself. Uh, the procedure itself is done with the patient upright on the exam chair in the clinic. Next, we want to apply nasal anesthesia, anesthesia which is the key to a successful TNE. I typically spray the nose with a decongestant and lidocaine anesthetic. And I can 
further apply topical anesthesia with cotton pledgets, and that seems to really uh, improve the tolerability of the TNE. &E. I typically wait about two to five minutes for uh, anesthesia to take effect and then perform the procedure. Do we need pharyngeal anesthesia for transnasal esophagoscopy? I would say vast majority of the time it's not needed, but it's useful in some patients who are very sensitive and gaggy. However, giving anesthesia to the pharynx can often make it hard to initiate a dry swallow and make it hard to manage secretions. So we have to be ready to suction secretions, uh, particularly in a patient who may have significant swallowing disorder. So this shows a very simple uh, video showing how I uh, perform um, nasal anesthesia. So this is 4% uh, neosinephrine and lidocaine spray, followed by cotton pledgets placed in the nasal cavity. Nowadays, I just take a look to see which nasal cavity is more open, and then uh, just apply the medication to that side. And then uh, here's, uh, then you're able to just go ahead and do that procedure about two to five minutes later. Uh, different uh, physicians like to hold the TNE scope differently. So this is a fishing pole method where you kind of hold the uh, scope with your hand close to your uh, lower body or close to your hip. Uh, others like to hold it in the traditional GI method, holding it higher towards your shoulder. So in terms of the actual procedure, we start with a nasal endoscopy where we perform a quick view of the nasal cavities and choose the more open nas nasal cavity. The endoscope is then passed along the floor of the nose or through the middle meatus. And for this, you want to lubricate the scope really well. So if the, if the scope is lubricated well, typically with viscous lidocaine jelly, it goes in very nicely. And then the next uh, area that the scope uh, sees is the oropharynx, where you can evaluate the appearance of the base of tongue, pharynx, period from sinuses, noting any pooling of secretions or any lesions. Next, you have to traverse the UES, which is the most difficult part for the patient and the physician as well. Uh, in this uh, part, you advance the scope to the post cricoid area or the pure from sinus area. Uh, the patient can flex the head down slightly. Uh, and with the patient performing a dry swallow, the tip of the scope is passed gently through the upper esophageal sphincter, uh, timed to the swallow. And the feel of the uh, scope going through is very similar to placing a nasogastric tube. You want to gently push forwards as the patient swallows, but do not force. Once you pass the UES, you insufflate the air to visualize the esophageal lumen. And you want to insufflate only as much uh, as needed to view an open lumen and initiate secondary peristalsis. And we try not to insufflate too much air while we're in the esophagus or in the stomach. The uh, scope is then advanced uh, slowly through the esophageal lumen, noting any abnormalities such as lesions, discolorations, pooling of liquids, foreign bodies. Once in the uh, uh, gastroesophageal junction, again, you can visualize the difference in the mucosa of the esophagus, which is red-gray, versus gastric mucosa, which is salmon pink. Uh, you note the uh, junction for irregularities, Barrett's changes, masses, hiatal hernia. And then to open the LES, uh, you have to insufflate a small amount of air right above the LES, or you can also pump some fluid right over the LES, and then with a little gentle insufflation of air, uh, the uh, LES will open. And sometimes you can also ask the patient to swallow and wait for the LES to open. Once in the stomach, you perform a retroflexed view of the gastroesophageal junction to assess for paraesophageal and hiatal hernias and the, all the air from the stomach is suctioned and the, soft, uh, the, the scope is retracted. And again, just like a regular uh, esophagoscopy, you're looking for uh, any abnormal findings on the way out uh, of the esophagus, suctioning out excess uh, air and all the, allow the esophagus to collapse. So in terms of uh, complications, uh, the complications are quite minor. Typically, epistaxis can occur in 2 to 4% of cases. Some patients can have vasovagal reaction, which is quite rare. Uh, the other issues for the inability to perform the procedure includes uh, too narrow a nasal cavity and just excessive gagging or vomiting. Uh, 
Some of the contraindications may include highly anxious patients, uh, very tight nasal cavity, as I just mentioned. And typically, you know, this is more of a diagnostic procedure than a, a therapeutic procedure. So uh, typically, uh, uh, procedures that require a prolonged time uh, typically cannot be performed using this technique. So I want to show you just a, a video from the beginning to the end showing transnasal esophagoscopy. Here we are going through the nasal cavity following the uh, floor of the nose. You can see the turbinate above you. We're facing towards the nasopharynx. The first curve is to go through the nasopharynx. And then you can then visualize the oropharynx. And at this point, I'm taking the scope into the left piriform sinus, uh, going through the piriform sinus, and then having the patient swallow. Uh, typically uh, is more successful than going right in the center in the postcoricoid area. We just passed to the left mainstem bronchus. This is the cardiac area. I'm just giving enough air to insufflate the esophagus. And here you can see slightly irregular Z-line, slightly pa patulous lower esophageal sphincter. The uh, food that you saw in the stomach is green because I've just done a endoscopic evaluation of swallowing where we use green food dye to visualize the bolus better. And now we're just allowing that area to open, looking at the GE junction, followed by a retraction. So on a you know, relatively normal uh, esophagus, you can see that the procedure can be done quite rapidly. Okay, so let's talk about findings. As you can see from these uh, pictures, I've encountered almost everything that could probably be found um, in the esophagus. Uh, just to kind of you know, quickly uh, review esophageal dysphagia, we typically uh, divide them into neuromuscular disorders and mechanical lesions. So in terms of neuromuscular disorders, there is primary neuromuscular disorders such as achalasia, diffuse esophageal spasm, nutcracker esophagus, ineffective esophageal motility, and secondary neuromuscular disorders such as scleroderma, Chagas disease, other collagen disorders. And in terms of mechanical lesions, we have intrinsic lesions such as strictures, Schatzky ring, dysplasia, cancer, tumor, diverticula, or extrinsic such as vascular compression, mediastinal abnormalities. So obviously, with the transnasal esophagoscopy, you're focusing mostly on the mechanical lesions. So um, I'm just going to go through a few pearls uh, uh, that I have uh, gained uh, over time doing transnasal esophagoscopy. So the first is that uh, esophageal exam is needed when oropharyngeal swallow is normal in a patient complaining of dysphagia. So here's a case of a 34-year-old man with dysphagia to all food consistencies. Uh, you can see the laryngoscopy picture over here is quite normal. And he had a fees performed, which was normal as well. But he had a very strong uh, dysphagia symptom. And therefore, a transnasal esophagoscopy was done. And upon doing that, you can see the esophagus is completely filled with the swallow, uh, the food that we just used for the swallow evaluation. That's why it looks uh, green. Uh, this, uh, the right lower hand picture is of another patient where uh, uh, I had uh, looked prior to uh, giving a swallow study with the food, green food. So you can see how it looks uh, without the green dye. And there is uh, a food and liquid filling up the esophagus. And so uh, this patient then subsequently was referred uh, to our esophageal center and with a diagnosis of achalasia and underwent uh, Heller myotomy. Case two is a 56-year-old man with dysphagia for solids over the past few months. He noted a sensation of food sticking to the back of his throat, which was alleviated by coughing. He denied heartburn or chest symptoms. He had a normal laryngoscopy and normal swallow test in the office. So we had uh, a TNE performed which then revealed a large hiatal hernia, distal esophageal erosion, Barrett's changes in peptic stricture. So this patient was again referred for endoscopy with biopsy, dilation, and starting on proton pump inhibitors.
Another pearl is that esophageal exam is needed in a patient who has had chemoradiation therapy uh, for head and neck cancer and now has complaints of dysphagia. So this case is a patient who is a 60-year-old man, had radiation therapy for tonsillar cancer. He had dysphagia, he was G-tube dependent, and he had just, uh, uh, he had just uh, gotten a modified barium swallow test that said, decreased laryngeal elevation, pharyngeal weakness, incomplete UES relaxation. So the question is, is the UES dysfunction here due to pharyngeal weakness, which is present in patients with uh, uh, radiation history for head and neck cancer, or is it decreased laryngeal elevation that is not opening the upper esophageal sphincter? So this is a perfect candidate for performing an in-office transnasal esophagoscopy, and you can see that the patient actually has a stricture. So what was useful about this is that uh, the TNE and e shows an incomplete stricture, and so I can plan dilation in the operating room, and looking at that stricture, I can most likely place a guide wire through that uh, opening and be able to do an anterograde uh, dilation. As opposed to this gentleman, a 58-year-old man, he had uh, chemoradiation therapy for base septum cancer. He is NPO and G-tube dependent. Dysphagia evaluation showed that he's unable to swallow anything given to him, so he gets a transnasal esophagoscopy which showed a complete stricture. And this was useful because if I see a complete stricture, then I can plan a anterograde retrograde dilation uh, in advance. Uh, and so I can plan for, or plan, you know, I can discuss this uh, with the patient in advance. And we almost have a dictum in uh, otolaryngology where a patient who has had chemoradiation therapy and a G tube is placed during chemoradiation therapy, and the patient uh, is unable to eat anything by mouth, is almost always esophageal uh, stricture until proven otherwise. So another pearl is that esophageal exam is needed when esophagopharyngeal reflux of food or liquid is present. So this is a case of a 67-year-old man with dysphagia symptoms over two years. Uh, he had a swallow evaluation, and uh, this is not a dynamic study, it's, a, it's a, a photograph of the finding, and what it's showing you on the left is uh, this green material that you see in the right piriform sinus actually was swallowed, and then it was regurgitated back into the, uh, the throat. So the patient might give you a, a history of eating and then food immediately coming back up. So this was a good candidate for a transnasal esophagoscopy, which shows a Zenker's diverticulum. If you look to, the, to that figure on the right, the esophageal opening is to the front, and the diverticulum is towards the back, and the diverticulum has that food and liquid material that was uh, just tested. So at this point, we know that this is a Zenker's diverticulum. No esophagram is needed, and we can pro proceed to do an endoscopic myotomy. I do want to discuss uh, Zanker's diverticulum versus Killian Jameson diverticulum because this continues to be confused, uh, uh, also by radiologists, um, uh, you know, calling every uh, upper esophageal uh, diverticulum a Zanker's diverticulum. So, uh, in in regards to the etiology for Zanker's diverticulum, it is thought that as the larynx descends with uh, uh, aging, a weakness develops at the Killian's dehiscence, which is uh, between the upper esophageal uh, sp uh, sphincter, the cricopharyngeus muscle, and the inferior constrictor muscle. And because the diverticulum is above the upper esophageal, uh, upper esophageal sphincter, uh, the path of least resistance is to send the food towards the mouth, so you get uh, reflux, uh, regurgitation. As opposed to a Killian Jameson diverticulum, which develops at the entry point of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, which is in the tracheoesophageal groove, and the recurrent laryngeal nerve enters the larynx below the cricopharyngeus muscle. So that's where the weakness is. And because the diverticulum develops below the upper esophageal sphincter, there is no regurgitation. The majority of the patients are actually asymptomatic. 
And uh, when they do come, they uh, complain of a lump feeling in the neck. And so this shows you the two views uh, that is important to consider. Uh, in a lateral view of the uh, uh, lateral view of the sophogram, you should see the Zenker's diverticulum posteriorly with the uh, big uh, cricopharyngeal bar anteriorly. And on a transnasal esophagoscopy, you can see that there is a posterior pouch with a large cricopharyngeous muscle in the middle and then the esophageal opening anteriorly. In a Killian Jamieson diverticulum, you'll see the esophageal lumen uh, over here uh, on the right figure towards the left, and the pouch is lateral to the patient's left. And on anterior posterior view, you should see the uh, diverticulum is to the side of the patient. And on a lateral view, the diverticulum for KJ will be in line with the esophagus. Esophageal exam is needed in patients with dysphagia and a history of anterior cervical disc fusion. This is a case of a man, 78 year old. He had a anterior and posterior neck fusion. Uh, he had dysphagia after anterior neck fusion. A uh, modified barium swallow test was done and it was read as uh, having cricopharyngeous prominence and reduced upper esophageal sphincter opening, and also with piriform sinus residue. And you can see there is a prominent uh, cricopharyngeal bar here, and the query was whether that was a uh, cricopharyngeal achalasia or is it a early Zenker's diverticulum. Well, this is a patient who requires a transnasal esophagoscopy or, you know, esophagoscopy, but we can do this in the office with a TNE. And you can see that actually what the patient has is a esophageal perforation with an exposed hardware, not a Zenker's, and this is actually the large perforation and the, what looks like the uh, Zenker's or the cricopharyngeal bar is actually the anterior lip uh, of the, uh, of the uh, perforation. And of course, with this diagnosis in the office, we can immediately plan to uh, treat the patient by removing the spinal hardware, repairing the perforation, and performing a uh, flap repair. So now we can talk about perhaps slightly more controversial, whether esophageal exam is indicated in nearly all cases of suspected extraesophageal reflux symptoms. Here's a case of a patient, 75-year-old female, who complained of chronic cough and dysphagia. She denies heartburn or regurgitation symptoms. A laryngoscopy is normal. A office swallow test is normal. So she gets a transnasal esophagoscopy, which reveals Barrett's esophagitis, hiatal hernia, and then this patient can then be referred for manometry, a pH study, and a fundoplation. I should mention that TNE can also be useful in diagnosing esophageal dysmotility. It's more of a screen, I should say, um, not a quantitative analysis, but uh, a pretty, fairly nice screening test. So here's a case of an 82-year-old man who complained of excessive thick mucus in his throat, uh, wet, weak voice, frequent coughing, and spitting clear secretions. He carried a diagnosis of gastroesophageal reflux disease and was an excellent with no improvement. He had no heartburn symptoms, but he did complain of occasional burning in the suprasternal notch. Laryngoscopy is normal. A swallow test showed uh, some follicular residue. You can see some green material that is between the tongue base and the epiglottis, indicating that the patient has uh, some pharyngeal weakness. He's, he then gets a uh, transnasal esophagoscopy uh, because of the significant symptoms that he has that is not explained by the small amount of uh, residue that you see there. And what you see here is significant tertiary contractions of the esophagus. So he was then sent for a modified barium swallow test and a high resolution manometry. The swallow test showed a non-obstructive CP bar. Uh, and we also at UCLA do esophageal screen in all our modified barium swallow tests. And that also showed delayed emptying of the esophagus and manometry was confirmatory for uh, uh, type 2 achalasia, and then we were able to uh, send him for uh, a, a poem procedure.
We can also do some functional assessment of esophageal dysmotility in suspected cases with TNE. So here's a case of a 62-year-old man with vague symptoms, dysphagia, and also a GERD symptoms. A swallow test is normal, laryngoscopy is normal. So then we can do a transnasal esophagoscopy, but for this particular patient, what you'll see is that as we have the scope in the esophagus, we're also giving him uh, some food to eat. So, as I mentioned earlier, there, the food in the esophagus should be going quite rapidly, you know, within eight to nine seconds, uh, should be clearing the esophagus, but in this particular situation, the food just stayed there for many minutes and ultimately never went through. So, again, this is a quick screen to kind of say, you know, I did a transnasal esophagoscopy, I'm not sure exactly what the uh, complaint is coming from, and a quick swallow test will sometimes reveal that the patient does have significant dysmotility, which might contribute to the symptoms, and then, of course, this patient that we would send for uh, a high-resolution manometry. So, lastly, I just want to briefly talk about upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. Uh, for me, you know, uh, there isn't a perfect test currently for diagnosing upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. Um, TNE is not that great for this because if you are having some difficulty going through the upper esophageal sphincter, you're not sure if this is actual tightness of the UES or you're just not really coordinating very well with the swallowing of the patient and therefore it feels like the upper esophageal sphincter area is tight. So I think currently we're still mostly relying on the modified barium swallow study and uh, perhaps a little less on manometry in terms of figuring out upper esophageal sphincter dysfunction. So this is a case of a 77-year-old man with severe dysphagia. He had uh, Botox injected to his upper esophageal sphincter twice. And uh, when he was seen in the clinic, you can see that uh, the food, there's significant food residue that is in the piriform sinus. So you know that the uh, that there is either significant pharyngeal weakness so that the food bolus cannot enter the esophagus or there is significant restriction at the upper esophageal sphincter level that prevents the food from going into the esophagus. So at this point, I performed a TNE and there was some tightness around that area. A modified barium was then ordered which showed a fairly uh, significant uh, hypertrophy of the upper esophageal sphincter, and this is a patient that we subsequently performed a endoscopic myotomy. So chronic UES dysfunction can uh, cause uh, dysphagia. Uh, we will often see on a modified barium swallow test uh, pharyngeal dilation, and sometimes even weakness. If you have a prolonged uh, achalasia, you can ultimately result in the pharynx kind of giving up and becoming weak, and once you treat the uh, cricopharyngeus uh, with surgery, uh, the pharyngeal strength uh, also seems to come back, which is quite interesting. Uh, typically, the uh, uh, etiology uh, is idiopathic. We see this very frequently in patients with radiation therapy due to fibrosis. We see this in patients uh, uh, with neurologic conditions, typically after a stroke, uh, or vagal or recurrent nerve paralysis, and in some patients with striated muscle disorders such as myopathies, uh, myasthenia gravis, uh, inclusion body myositis, and uh, uh, oculopharyngeal myopathies. Okay, so uh, we have reached the end. Thank you very much. Uh, and there's our clinic number uh, and for the, for the swallowing disorders program.